Welcome to Let's Get Writing. I'm your host, Katherine Taylor. Now, Let's Get Writing is all about the writing process from creation to publication. And here is where you can find inspiration, ideas, and meet the people behind the stories. We bring life to books. And you can always ask a question in the comments and we'll do our best to respond, if not during the show, certainly after. And we do monitor that for a few days. And to stay up to date on all of our programming, you can do that right here at Katherine Taylor Media on Facebook or also on the YouTube channel at Katherine Taylor TV. Now, on with the show. My guest today, well, actually, I have two guests coming on the show today, which is something new and exciting, I hope for you. My first guest was born in Gander, Newfoundland, and currently lives in Bedford, Nova Scotia. He holds graduate degrees in history from Memorial and Dalhousie Universities, and currently works for Parks Canada as the Culture Resource Manager in mainland Nova Scotia. And he's based at the beautiful Halifax Citadel National Historic Site. Such a great place to work, right in the heart of the city. Now, he's an historian and, of course, the ideal person to write a book called Rough Justice on the early history of policing and crime in Newfoundland. So we'll welcome him to, him to the show right now. Keith, welcome to Let's Get Writing. And you should be up here. There you are. How are you? There I am. There you I'm good. I'm good. There are you too, which is great. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, actually, I have a copy of your your book right here for people who haven't seen seen the book. A little bit of reflection there in the cover, and it's quite a substantial book, Keith. <laughs> that must have been a lot of work. And um, for people who uh, who don't know the actual title of the book is rough justice policing crime and the origins of the newfoundland constabulary from 1729 to 1871 and keith from your biography i think there could be no one better to write a book like this and uh, how did that come about Yeah, so there's a there's a little bit of a backstory there, as there usually is. Um, so the the book is a commissioned work. It was commissioned by the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary Historical Society. So that's basically a heritage group affiliated with the the RNC. And uh, the RNC, if you've you know if you've met it, any of its officers, retired or, or active, are very proud of their heritage. And uh, this heritage group uh, was established in the late 1980s and uh, their mission really is to tell the story of the force and to undertake commemorative activities um and you know they've done that through a variety a variety of means uh there's they've, they've unveiled a beautiful monument a little park at in downtown st john's and exhibits and that kind of thing and one of the things they always wanted to do because they felt like uh there wasn't uh that kind of book out there uh, was to have a scholarly history of the force in early policing and uh so that's that's how i came to get involved about 10 years ago and it was just fortuitous they uh i think they were looking ahead a little bit to 2021 so it's timely which is the 100th 150th anniversary uh, of the establishment of the the constabulary in 1871 and uh, i guess i was in the right place at the right time and i was looking for a project and uh and here we are well, I, I call that a project. <laughs> when I lift the book, even you know, there's substantial weight to it. That had, you know, that's that's a project. I'll give you that. But Keith, um, really, even though that um, was when the constabulary was established, I think the policing actually existed some time before that. Did it not? Or because 1871 was the establishment of the constabulary. But prior, the, the period prior was the whole advent of policing in our province. Yeah, that's right. And so 1871 is really my end date. So I think uh, before this time, there really wasn't a lot on policing uh, in the early period when you look at Newfoundland history books and that kind of thing. And 1871 was seen to be, to some degree, the start of policing with the, the, the formal establishment of the force. Uh, but of course, I found a uh, 
uh, a lot of material that says otherwise. And uh, I go back oh, almost 150 years before that uh, to the appointment of the very first constables and magistrates in Newfoundland. And I take that story right up to 1871 through lots of twists and turns. And, and so there's, it, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot to it. There's, uh, and what I found is that, uh, you know, constables may have been uh, some of the lower level officers when it comes to the justice system, but they were integral to making that justice system work and they're keeping their communities. They were just, they were absolutely pivotal. And um, so I hope that's, you know, if, if someone takes anything away from the book, I think it, I think it's that. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking through the book, you could see that they they were somewhat ordinary people. They were people who were appointed who didn't really have a background. I guess there was really no reference for a background in Newfoundland at that time when they, they arrived there. Um, they were parts of communities. They weren't trained. They I don't even think they were paid at that time, were they? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that structure. Yeah, so most of the, until the mid 19th century and the establishment of what we would call uh, more professional law enforcement, particularly in St. John's, but then some of the larger towns, Harbor Grace and Carbonier and Conception Bay, you're right. Uh, the early police officers were amateurs and part-time uh, law enforcement officials and they had day jobs. Most of them from what we would call today middle-class uh, background. So they were uh, planters that is, you know, fishermen who owned some property and had some status, uh, artisans, tradespeople. And uh, in St. John's in particular, there developed this very strange scenario where um, publicans, so tavern keepers, uh, for about a generation uh, were forced to serve as policemen as part of the, as part of their license for getting, uh, selling their liquor. So, uh, so there are a lot of tavern keepers involved too. But yeah, you're right. And, uh, there wasn't a lot of training in those days. Uh, there wasn't a lot of pay, um, uh, but they, you know, they did get some. The, the, for the work they did for the courts, they were compensated for the actual uh, orders they carried out and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a story. It's quite a background. It is, and I, I can almost think. Well, if you were a tavern owner, I guess you had no choice. You kind of had to take the role on. But if you were someone in the community. At times, to take a role like that, it had to have its challenges, I would think, at times even dangerous and maybe not even easy on the family of the person who took that on. Did you uncover stories like that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, in some communities where, you know, we're not, not talking large communities and there's not a lot of people, right? I think there was a, a certain expectation that. Uh, people from a certain pedigree uh, would be expected uh, to fulfill these roles of public service to some degree. I think there was, uh, for some people, you know, there there were some financial inducements. So I think that helped, you know, it supplemented their their incomes. But uh, but generally speaking, it put them in a hard spot. I mean, the things that they had to do, they had to carry out court orders. So these are things like search warrants, arrest warrants, foreclosures on properties attachment on properties, uh, punishing offenders. And this puts you in direct conflict sometimes with your neighbors and, uh, and other people in these communities. And it must have led to hard feelings. And it must have led to people not wanting to serve because uh, you know the, the problems just outweighed the rewards. And so there are some instances of that, as particularly uh, constables pushing back on, on punishing uh, um, felons and, and vagrants and that kind of thing. It's just a, um, you know, it's a nasty part of their work that uh, most people wouldn't have wanted to get involved in. So, uh, so that, I mean, that speaks to the title of the book, uh, Rough Justice and the justice system and policing in those days was rough. And mm -hmm. uh, these guys encountered it sometimes when they, you know, when they walked the beat or they, they were the ones knocking on your doors. Uh, not everyone was happy to see them. And so they, they received, uh, they experienced resistance and um, they experienced rough justice. And um, yeah, it had to be hard. And, and you know, the courts weren't always there to back them up. And so it, uh, you know, in some ways it was a thankless job, but in other ways, like I said before, it was absolutely pivotal to keeping these communities safe. And, 
and municipal governance and these kinds of things. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of a balancing act there. Yeah, you know, Keith, when I got thinking about it, about the book and about those situations, I started to think about, well, who were these people who came and populated Newfoundland at that time? They weren't always like the the most desirable of people. Quite often their options might, have, I'm assuming, be limited back in the, the old country. And they, they were probably some rough people that ended up here initially to start our island. Do you, do you think I'm right in assuming that? Um, they weren't always the, the high end of society who ended up on this rock. Yeah, there are there are always push and pull factors for immigration. And sometimes the reason people would make this really significant move from Ireland or England or Scotland in the old days is because there are opportunities for fading away where they were. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe, you know, there were things going on with the enclosure of lands and they didn't have access to property and they thought maybe over here we would. Uh, but there were, there were different, you know, there were different classes of, of folks who, who came. You had the elites and merchants and so forth. You had planters and tavern keepers and artisans and people kind of, the people I'm talking about who represented the middle, uh, the middle of society. But then most people were servants of one form or another. Um, and uh, yeah, so those were the ones who interacted with the courts the most. Uh, no servants that I'm aware of uh, or served as police constables in this period. Um, but you're right, there's, there's a lot of colorful stories, a lot of colorful characters. And uh, I, hope that, I hope that comes through in the book and, and the many case, case studies that are there. Mm -hmm. Keith, taking on a project like, like this, this show is a little bit about writing and how these things come about. It's a commissioned work, and I've actually never had anyone on the show who has actually been someone who's been commissioned to write a book like that. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what it's like to accept a role like that and how, how common maybe this opportunity is or not common at all maybe? Sure. Well, it was new for me too. Uh, so I'm, I, you know, I, I know, uh, I know of some people who've uh, undertaken commission projects. Um, so I'm not sure that my experience is, uh, you know, gels perfectly with everyone else's experiences. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it is different in some ways, and then it's, it's very, it's the same in some ways. So the way it's the same for my project is, you know, that that big book you have in your hand there. Uh, you know, the research and the writing and the creativity and the choices and the arguments that are in there, they are all my own. So I had 100% literary and scholarly independence. And so even if this is a project I would have taken on independently uh, and, and just, you know, this is a subject that would have been interested in, the book would have been the same. So that, I mean, that was wonderful, especially from an author's perspective. Uh, but it, you know, it, it is also different because you, someone engaged you to undertake this work and someone has paid you to a certain extent to take out this work. And so there are certain expectations that go with that that wouldn't be there with another project, perhaps. Uh, you know, there's a certain level of oversight and, and sometimes a little bit of pressure, particularly on scheduling, right, to, to actually get the thing done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a little bit different. Um, but I know from my experience, uh, in the end, this was a very, a very positive experience. Um, I think, you know, I, I look at the, you know, the book that's sitting here beside me. I'm very happy with it. Uh, I know that uh, everyone involved seems to be very happy with the, the final product. And uh, the, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary Historical Society, uh, my partner uh, in this project, uh, you know, it was really a team effort. And when it came to the final stages, when it came to engage in a publisher, and we got a wonderful publisher in Flanker Press, Jerry Cranford and his team, and uh, engaging, mm -hmm. you know, an editor, a good editor to help me at the end, and people to make maps, and people to compile an index, and all those kinds of nuts and bolts that, that go into publishing at the end. They took care of a lot of that, and uh, that was really instrumental to getting the final product to, to look the way it is today. So, it you know, it is different, like I say, in, in those regards, but in terms of the product, when I look at it, uh, it wouldn't have been any different than if I just chose it on my own. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thrilled that that's the case. Yeah, and and honestly, what you did say about Flanker Press and and Jerry, they're very keen to bring out 
products that do reflect aspects of Newfoundland. And it, it is a beautiful book. And anyone who has an interest in the history of our province in respect to policing or just in general, I feel it does give you a sense of what things were like back then, would I feel would enjoy this book. And Keith, there seems to be a strong interest in historical literature in our province. Would you agree? Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree. And I know we, we talked uh, before we came on a couple of days ago about this. I, you know, if you, uh, you see it here where I am in, in Nova Scotia, you go to the local, the local interest sections in, in your bookstore, but particularly in Newfoundland, you go to uh, your, your local bookstore, whether it's a, a big bookstore like a Chapters or a Down Home or whatever, the, the shelves are bursting, uh, not just with titles, but with talent. And, uh, and you take a closer look and it's not just fiction. A lot of the, these are nonfiction titles and a lot of, there's a, there's a, a massive interest, I think, in the history of uh, Newfoundland and communities. And it's always been that way. And it, to a certain degree, I think it's more integrated with even mainstream society and Newfoundland politics than it might be, it might be in other places. And I would go a step further. I mean, I'm a, I'm a great reader of fiction uh too so i'm not just uh you know history is not my only interest and i read a lot of historical fiction and i would say that some of the very best fiction uh being produced in newfoundland over the past generation or two uh, by our best our mainstream authors is historical fiction sometimes using the same sources that i use sometimes talking about real historical characters so so i think uh history is very important uh to newfoundlanders and uh, I think I think they're very interested and they're engaged and and hopefully they're buying the books. I'm 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 told that they they are and I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm very happy with uh, like I say not just uh, the final product but the reception that I received so far. Yeah, and you did end up having a virtual book launch there about a week ago. I guess the, you know this is all we can do in these times. We have to adapt. And um, so wonderful. And people wanting to find the book, of course, Flanker's, Flanker Press's site and other locations around the province, I would expect. And if you're not in the province, there's always places like Flanker Online or Amazon. Keith, um, just, I just want to ask one more thing very quickly. When you were doing a lot of the research uh, for the book, where did, you, where did you go? How did you find this material? Oh, that's a big question for an historian. Um, and yeah, you have to well, keep it process, short. <laughs> really. uh, yeah, so you know, a book like this, if you take a quick glance at the sources, the bibliography, you'll understand that a lot of the work for a book like this is, is primary research. So the, the folks, the staff at places like the Rooms Provincial Archives and Memorial University Center for Newfoundland Studies probably would have seen too much of me or heard too much from me over the past few years. So that's, that's really where you go uh, to libraries and archives and you're using primary research materials. And, uh, and I made great use of them for this book, a whole range of things, but particularly things like court records that, that let you speak to ordinary people in these old times. Mm -hmm. Well, Keith, thank you for taking that project on and for creating something that I think will be of interest to people for years to come and really gives us, and thank you to the Historical Society, it gives us a record of how we evolved in, in the area of policing. And it's not done. I mean, you've only gone to 1871 when the constabulary was established, so there may be another book in the works uh, in future for the Historical Society, I'm thinking. There is indeed. I won't be writing it, because I, I think I've done my part, but uh, uh, so stay tuned for that. Someone else, uh, a, a great author, will take it closer to the present day. And, and uh, yeah, so we're not finished, but I, you know, thank I you. And I, I hope uh, oh, uh, lots of you take a look at this book and thanks for your interest. Yeah, and thank you, Keith, for coming on. And uh, I, I wish you every success. I hope you get some tourists over there in Nova Scotia this summer, but it's hard to say what's going to happen <laughs> anywhere. If anyone wants to reach out to you, Keith, is there a good way to do that? Um, do you have anything on Facebook or um, or through Flanker Press, perhaps? Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's a, there's a, 
there's a few ways. Flanker, uh, you go through Flanker, you'll get me. I'm on uh, some versions of social media, so Twitter and, and LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, in my day job, you can find uh, I'm happy to, to talk to folks about history and particularly this book. Great. Well, thanks so much and in, enjoy your day. And uh, we'll be keeping in touch with you if anything further comes up. Thanks so much, Keith. All right. And next, I'm going to move right along. And we have another guest coming. And I'm going to say goodbye, Keith. And here's my technology. <laughs> and we'll bring up Emily Hapditch. Hi, Emily. How are you? Now, I'm not hearing you. Um, let's see. Can I hear you now? Oh, I better unmute you. That would help. Can you hear me now? Everything. <laughs> I can hear you now. It's all these technological things that I have to do the interviews and manage myself. There are times I miss the studio. <laughs> Emily, <laughs> you have you were on the show last year in 2020, and we talked about your first book which was The Woman in the Attic, which for which you received many accolades and, and you were number one for local interest books, I think in Atlantic Books Today, for 10 consecutive yeah. uh, months. Quite a whirlwind. With that book. Yeah, and you being a new author and now you have another book out which is called Alone on the Trail. <laughs> and yeah, there it is. And I've got... Uh, and I just had the pleasure of reading it. Uh, let me just see. I want to show it. There it is. Oh, it is up. And Emily, that didn't take you too long. When I interviewed the la you the last time, you said, oh, I'm working on another book. And I think that was actually even in the, maybe in the fall. And here it is on the shelves in our hands. <laughs> I've got my copy oh. here too. And uh, yeah, and I've read it and it's, it's just as, oh, yeah, it's just as good a read as the as your first book. So how did it all come about? How did you get this book written so quickly? Um, I always tell people, once I get an idea in my head, I try to finish the, the book as quickly as possible because I always have a fear that I'm going to lose my inspiration for a story. Um, so this was inspired by a hiking trip I took actually last summer with some friends. We hiked uh, the Grossmore Mountain and it really got the gears spinning and I had to ask myself, hey, what could go wrong? Um, on a hike like this. Um, so once kind of the idea got into my head, I knew I was going to have to write as quickly as possible because I didn't want any ideas to leave my head. And um, yeah, so I, it took about three, three months to complete in full. And that was just to make sure that everything was as developed as possible. That's phenomenal. And you're so young. You're, I think, 23. And you're setting this wonderful <laughs> example for us. And I wondered, I had wondered if you had actually taken that hike. Because, so did you take the actual one where you got off the... No, I haven't taken the, the traverse, either of the traverse mm -hmm. trails um, like the hikers do in this book. I, I haven't been brave enough to do that yet. Um, but I have done the mountain and I've done quite a few hikes um, here on the East Coast. So um, Yeah, I know. Pro, You're a but... fan. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've done the mountain too. That's quite, that's quite a walk up and down. Yeah, yeah okay. it is. Yeah, and Emily, I guess you can have lots of time to think while you're doing that. And I just put on the screen that you have a virtual book launch tonight, and I, I wanted to draw people's attention to that. And that's going to be on Flanker Press. So what are we going to expect to see there tonight? Um, I plan to do a reading. I'm hoping to get through maybe Chapter 1. Um, without ruining any of the surprises, of course. But um, there's going to be a reading, and then there's going to be a question and answer afterwards, uh, where if you have any questions at all, you can pop them into the chat, and I'll answer them live. Exactly, just as we can do here, but I haven't received any. I think we go a little early in the day for a lot of people, probably still at work. <laughs> and Emily, um, when you wrote the second book, did you feel any kind of anxiety about following up your first effort? Did anything hold you back there? Definitely. I mean, there's nerves associated with writing any book because, I mean, you're kind of wearing your heart on your sleeve and then kind of putting it forth into the world to be, you know, enjoyed and judged and whatnot. Um, so I was definitely nervous just because it was it is so different from The Woman in the Attic. It involves more characters. It's more kind of action based as opposed to psychological. 
Um, and uh, the characters are each so different that I, I of course, uh, had a, a, quite some nervousness about uh, sharing it with the world. But you just kind of got to push past that and have faith that, um, you know, your story is your story. And no matter what the result, um, as long as you had fun writing it, it's all worthwhile. Oh, and it's a great story. Thank you. It was one of those books that I didn't like to put down. I wanted to know, okay, what's going to happen next? And you had some nice twists and turns in there. I really enjoyed it. Mm, but hey, you have some good news. The from the Canadian Crime Writing, I don't know if we call them the awards. Why didn't you tell us all about that? Um, yeah, so recently uh, I found out that The Woman in the Attic is shortlisted for Crime Writers of Canada, um, their first novel award. So that's a huge honor. That's such a wonderful um, organization. And to make the shortlist was, I had no expectations of that at all. So that was such a wonderful surprise. And I'm so grateful for that. And Emily, when will you hear about that? Um, I believe early May the winner will be announced. But again, to be nominated is is the most wonderful thing so i'm just thrilled well it is and it's a great and it's a great endorsement from you because for you when i think about it um your first book i think was shortlisted for a number of awards as well was it not uh yes so um so this is uh again is the woman in the attic um yeah I'm actually lucky enough um to be the winner of nl reads this year uh for the woman in the attic which is here um, and that is a, a contest that goes on every year through the public libraries. Um, four books were selected as finalists, uh, chosen by reader advocates across the province. Um, and then the public uh, can vote on their, their favorite book. Um, so I was so very grateful to be the winner of that wonderful award. And it was such a wonderful experience through and through. Well, you're truly an inspiration for all the writers out there and, and certainly the readers as well. Emily, have you learned anything along the way that you want to share before we wrap up? Any any new pointers? And I'm going to encourage people to go back and watch your original interview because we did delve in a lot into your process. But anything new to share with people? Um, I think as you know, time goes on, I think the biggest thing is to always keep in mind um, you have to kind of write for yourself first. So you have to write the stories that you feel compelled to write and just focus on all of the positive, wonderful things that come your way and live each day with so much gratitude because, I mean, this is a roller coaster ride through and through, um, but it's so incredibly wonderful and I feel so much gratitude to be on it. So, wow. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And again, to remind everyone that tonight, uh, April 28th, because I'm not sure when you're watching it, but if you're watching it after the fact, that is going to be on Flanker Press's YouTube channel, and it will be there, and you can go back at any time and see it. And I just want to remind people who are viewing that you can catch any of our shows on YouTube.com, Catherine Taylor TV, all the earlier Let's Get Writing, and the one with Emily, which I will have in the comments down below if you happen to be watching it on your computer and you can just hook right into that and emily i want you to have a wonderful time tonight and you and i are actually going to jump on here again very shortly and you are going to read a little from your book for us and then we're going to be on instagram so we have a full day <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. oh a pleasure and thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you again next week on let's get writing and i believe my guest is going to be Carolyn R. Parsons. So stay tuned. Bye now. <laughs>